Hello and welcome to the Group Think Podcast. My name is Tyler. In this episode of the show, we have another special guest, that being Kyle Mann. Kyle Mann is the lead writer for the Babylon Bee and is one of several people who work there. I've had the opportunity to interview him for Geeks Under Grace, and this is our first time talking. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, good to be talking to you. Sure. So I, I don't want to go super into Babylon Bee necessarily, given that we kind of did talk a lot of this last year when I interviewed you. But I guess I, guess I wanted to start out with... Uh, what does it feel like to be the most prominent voice in Christianity at the moment, and how depressing is that for you? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird feeling when you, uh, you know, I have, I have heroes of the Christian faith that uh, that I look up to, and then you'll see like some, you know, satire piece that I write. And it goes bananas, and it's getting read, and it's getting shared more than you know pieces that I I think are more deserving. <laughs> you know, I'm like, stop reading my jokes and start reading uh, more important stuff. But I mean, I you know, I guess that's the power of satire, and that it can it can you know communicate truth about important things uh, in, you know, in a way that people that kind of cuts through some of the noise and gets to people a little bit. Sure. So what's the what's the trajectory of the site been in the past year since we talked? Uh, it's uh, it's been going it's been going crazy. I don't remember exactly when we talked, but it was I mean, what was it a year ago? And uh, yeah, I, I became the editor in chief about a year ago, a little over a year ago. So before that, I was writing part time, um, and uh, and now I, I run the whole site. And I mean, it's just it, 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 you know it's going upwards and up. I think last month of uh, May was our uh, was our biggest month ever in terms of traffic. So it's just going crazy. Oh wow, it's just going to keep getting bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, you know, it hasn't slowed down yet. That's good. My neighbor has started drilling again, so feel uh, I apologize if you start hearing drilling sounds in the background. <laughs> it's okay, you'll probably hear small children and animals running by me at any moment, so Oh my. So <laughs> So I guess the I, the, mo the most interesting thing to happen of late has been your the uh, the Snopes debunking for you. What, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know that's almost a regular thing now for us we get we had a couple dozen uh of our articles go up on snopes um but yeah it's always fun when that happens like you know you you, you do a piece and then it's almost like they're it's almost like they try to uh you know uh, i gotta use a geek analogy you know it's like uh, it's like hydra you know they 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 try to cut off our head and, and two more take its place you know the the uh, they try to fact check a piece and it just goes even crazier because of the fact check that that snopes will do so you know <laughs> it's almost pointless for them to try to do it but are they actually afraid that your people are taking babylon b as straight news or yeah you know, they just are they just you know, being, I... are they just being pedantic about this <laughs> that's the funny thing is like i understand why they fact check uh satire because people do take it they fact check the onion too you know uh, <laughs> It, they do, and it's because it's because people do take it seriously. They don't, you know. There's a lot of people that share satire and don't understand that it's satire. So I get why they do it. The problem is that the way that they fact check it, it's it's not like, hey guys, this is a joke. Like they'll actually do this long, you know, seven or eight paragraphs, you know, thousand word article, disproving each uh, part of the satire piece, and it's like it comes off really like. <laughs> It comes off like the geek at a party that's like, hey, actually, that's not true, you know? <laughs> so that, that's the only part of it that that, that's, that kind of cracks me up. Oh, gosh, my five-hour essay on The Last Jedi. No. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, I was... I've was, I was, been doing research lately for a book I'm working on, and one of the chapters was about the news, and some of the... I had to do a lot of deep diving into statistics on stuff, and I found that... 
there is a depressing number of people that actually think that the onion's actually real. Approximately, like, just shy of one in five people can't tell the difference. So, which that is... That doesn't surprise me. But funny... I, I've, I've, had pe I've had people share articles, Onion articles with me. Like in person, I was at a I was at a work meeting when I when I was uh, in the construction industry, and this guy, you know, successful owner of a business of a big construction business, pulls up his phone and shows me an article from the Onion about how uh, it was like two cruise ships opened cannon fire on each other, <laughs> and, he, and he's like he's like dead serious about it. He's like, can you believe this? You know, they they got into each other's territory and started firing cannons at each. You know, <laughs> and I have to be like the awkward the guy who's awkwardly like, oh, actually. No, well, that's not true, but... The funny thing for me was when I started reading the comparative statistics to it. So apparently, the the same number of people that think uh, The Onion is true also think Infowars is true. And <laughs> ab just above that is 20 at 25% is the number of Americans who think the moon landing is faked. So I think that that's kind of the threshold for how many... Uh, for the degree to which we assume something is uh, taken seriously, so... Yeah, wow. If you get if you if you get if you're taken seriously above the twenty five, you're doing pretty okay. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't want to go super in deep on on, on Babylon B unless you particularly want to because I, I obviously we covered a lot of this already. Uh, what what what's this year like been for you for like movies? Oh, you brought up the geek thing. What's it been like for like geek stuff for you? Um, my biggest uh, my biggest area of geekdom is tabletop games and uh so for tabletop games it's been it's been a pretty good year but i'm i i don't i don't super i don't really keep up on the hotness too much like i have to have the thing that's coming out you know right now um so I, I'm, I'm often you know going back and and replaying the classics both with tabletop and video games and and even movies i mean um this year for movies i think my favorite so far. I, I, I did like in game quite a bit, and um, and Detective Pikachu was a kind of a surprise hit. I enjoyed that one a lot. Um, I, I, I recall your penchant from uh, of uh, taking controversial stances. So, <laughs> oh, what, what's controversial about uh, Detective? Uh, do people not like Detective Pikachu? No, I, I, I don't. it's it's broadly liked, but it's it's one of those things where I think it's among people who already liked Pokemon, like. Have you, have you ever read Roger Ebert's review of Pokemon the movie? No. It, you should. It is the weirdest thing. It's watching someone who doesn't comprehend anything that's happening trying to mm. seriously, critically examine something that's clearly meant for a niche audience. I, I think that's yeah. kind, I think that's kind of the deal with Detective Pikachu too. So I don't I don't dislike it or anything. I think it's just for people who obviously have that nostalgia to it. Yeah, I so, mean, I think if I was ten, if I was ten years old still, and I saw that, my mind would have exploded. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of twenty-five-year-olds I know who had that experience. So, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So that was, that was good. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, that was a good movie. Endgame was good. Uh, I, I, Captain Marvel was middling. It's okay. I was gonna I say. Know, I guess I'm. I guess. Tread lightly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I mean, I, you know, I, I really like, I really like the MCU. I, I just, you know, my favorite MCU movies are the ones that uh, you, you can really see a strong, you, you can really see the director had a strong vision for it, and it comes off more like that director's movie than, uh, than like the formulaic, you know, paint by numbers approach, and and that one came off to me more like that. I was, I was going to say, it's, you, be careful what you say, otherwise tomorrow's headline is Vox, uh, Vox's headline is going to be, <laughs> Christian does not like women-led movie, but... Yeah, yeah. That's why I, that's why I didn't like it, because there were women in it. <laughs> he, yeah. That's, that's, that's a great audio sample right there. <laughs> yeah, you're just going to cut this whole thing down to... <laughs> yeah. This is great it's blackmail entire... material, thanks. Uh... <laughs> But yeah, I mean, so far for me, I haven't been... This has been a, kind of a weird movie year. I mean, obviously, Endgame is on track to become the highest grossing film of all time within the next two weeks, probably, at this point. But I mean, other than that, I, I, I've been kind of at war with most of the big blockbusters that came out. Did you see Godzilla? I did. I, I, I enjoyed it, but I was... 
I was I was still mildly perturbed about that too. Did you see Aladdin? No, I did. I did not want to subjugate myself to that. I, I am I, I am morally opposed to live action remakes <laughs> and like yeah, that's a hill to die on for me. So I did not see that. I will add a caveat to that. I I am fine with remakes of the bad Disney movies or the mediocre ones that no one has seen. So. If they get around to making a Black Cauldron remake, I'm I'm all for that. But I would watch a Black Cauldron remake. I, think. <laughs> I mean, I think that's where the territory is because that, that I kind of like Pete's Dragon for that reason. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll I'll compromise and agree with you. I, yeah, you know the problem with the ones that they remake your childhood favorite, your child childhood classic, and it's like. Why? You know, it, it, it's it, it's either like they're duplicating the scene exactly. You know, or or just like they're adding these weird songs and it just comes off like bad fan fiction. And I, it's, I oh man, yeah. I totally agree. I mean, that that was definitely the deal with the Beauty and the Beast one, especially. Oh, that that's the one I feel the strongest about. I, it's just like oh, you know, why are they doing this? Like I remember, I like when the Jungle Book one came out. I I liked it, but it was mostly just because it came out during like a really bad movie drought in early 2016. It was mm. like, okay, something, and at least it's not exactly the same as the original one. Yeah, I, I just, I couldn't, I could not generate enough emotion to care about that one, one, one way or the other. It was just like, okay, that, that was a thing that happened. That so. is, that is an exceptionally fine reaction. I mean, I, I, you're not wrong. I mean, I, it's, there's, it's a very cynical enterprise that they've got going with this whole thing. I don't know how yeah. long they're planning to keep it going. I know they're, supposedly they're going to be releasing their Lady and the Tramp movie when they get Disney Plus going in November or so. That's horrifying. I oh um, <laughs> uh, Shazam. I like Shazam a lot. I forgot about that. I like Shazam too. I think it's it's probably one of the better blockbuster films I've seen this year. But yeah. I, I yeah, didn't. Right. I didn't quite fall in love with it. I don't know why. I mean, maybe maybe it's a kind of reflexively anti Frenchian attitude. But I don't know. I I I thought it was good. It's it it is one of those things. Like if I see a movie in the theater, I, my feelings are not. Like I need to, I need to watch it later. I need to watch it again, you know, because I sometimes I just can't, I can't process it, and so that, that's kind of how I felt about that one. But I'm, I'm starting to fear I'm becoming an intolerable snob, but mm. which is just the worst. Because last year is like, what was your favorite movie? Oh well, there was this amazing art film that was released on Net. No, <laughs> I can't go down oh, this yeah. path. <laughs> yeah, you, you did that. You, that's right. You posted something on Twitter. I think right. In regards to being a snob, or I, I thought I thought you posted a bunch of pictures of, uh, or you put you some some obscure Blu-rays or something that you got. <laughs> no, th those were. Was uh, that you? That probably was me. I I uh, I got a copy of a German movie that came out called Never Look Away, and it's because the, yes, fir the first one it. because I'd seen the the first one was a, a very fa I, I don't I gonna sound horrible about this it was a very famous german movie from 2007 that is mostly remembered because i, I people like a, a ton of it became like a cult classic film about the horrors of uh, the stasi in, in uh, during the soviet union it, it's mm -hmm. a it's a really spectacular film but it's not super but, well known um, and then they turned out the guy who made it with a film like another like just last year and just out of nowhere so but did uh but did it have giant monsters no, it was five hours of German art, so. But no giant monster. <laughs> it, it might it might have been interesting just to have just a monster in the background, just at all times. Oh my gosh, this is hilarious. I was trying to find that video you posted, and you, 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 you tweeted a video of Alex Jones, and I need... <laughs> I need to stay. Was it the folk like song? In, was it he's the... like in Mine, he's in Minecraft. <laughs> the most, I think, the most recent one I posted was the one where they, he's, where they, someone auto-tuned his voice into a folk song. Oh my! Oh, I, I've seen that one. <laughs> he's talking, he's singing about the frogs or something, and they. Uh, yeah, I think, there I think I've seen that one. a bunch of demon hunted man. They want to yeah. eat babies. <laughs> yeah. That's the one. <laughs> That night just lost it. Classic. So, well, uh, you know we've we've uh, run the gamut from uh, 
German art films to Alex Jones and Minecraft. So there's <laughs> nothing left to talk about. Oh, gosh. I mean, <laughs> how's life? <laughs> so, yeah, life's good, you know. Uh, German art films are, are good. It's a good season for that. Yeah, so my big thing, it, you know, if we're talking geek culture, my biggest uh, thing right now is I'm playing uh, Fantasy Fly Games has released a Lord of the Rings board game, which, you know, whatever it's it's they, they release one every week but they've released one for uh that's called journeys in middle earth and it's based on their old mansions of madness system and it's basically like a big dungeons and dragons campaign in a box you know but they, they, they you use your phone you use an app on your phone to be the dungeon master and me and a buddy went through and we we just we just slammed through the campaign in like four sessions and we're about to do it again. So that has been, uh, that's been my, my recent, uh, obsession. Uh, I tend to like play something a lot and then move on to the next thing. But so I saw you, comment- I, my- I saw you commenting on that. I saw you, you I said you lost the first time or well, we, well, yeah. So it kind of sucked because you go through this whole <laughs> campaign and like, we got to the end of the scenario. It, it just pops up on the screen like, oh, by the way, if you lose this scenario, you're done. And so we're playing through it, and I'm I, I'm playing as Gimli, and I've, you know, I, I'm just like, I, I've been amazing the whole campaign. Like, I, I haven't even taken, like, a point of damage. I'm just, like, crushing everybody. And then I get to, like, this last boss, and uh, we have like one turn to go to get all the way across the map and escape, and it's like, okay, we're, we're fine. We're, we got this. And, you know, the game doesn't have any dice, but you, you draw cards instead of dice, and I basically I basically rolled like snake eyes. Like, I got nothing. I had all these powers. I used all of them. I got nothing. And I end up getting just, you know, Gimli's head gets chopped off or whatever, and it's like, okay. <laughs> oh, no. uh, you know, and, and then you get like a saving throw. You know, so I get my save. I, I do my saving throw of like, okay, I, I might be able to pull this out. It's the last stand, and and I just and I draw blanks. Like I, every success in my deck was at the bottom. I'm like, this is horrible. So I uh, so we ended up losing like we're like we're 12 games deep at this point. We've invested like 15 hours, and I die and ruin it for our whole party. So that was uh, <laughs> that was that was tough to to bear. Oh man, is it is it like repeating the plot of the movie, or is it just a general Middle Earth set setting? You know, they may end up doing that, but they'll probably you know it, it's Fantasy Flight, and what they do is they they sell all, they sell you all the good stuff as expansions, you know. So in the base game, it's like this generic, you know, all these orcs are looking for some relic, and you've got to stop them. And I, honestly, I get the feeling that they designed it for like a generic setting, and then like. You know, a week before the game shipped, they're like, "Oh, we should do this in Lord of the in the Lord of the Rings universe," and then they just slapped, you know, Lord of the Rings on the box. But it's still fun. So well, that's cool. I mean, my my big uh, board game fixation in my life has always been Axes and Allies. I mean, my mm. I my my family is always skewed toward the more the uh, the war mongering sort. So we <laughs> we've always enjoyed this through ritual celebration. But my my, my dad still has a. Uh, a ROM of it. He, he that's he's managed to keep on his Windows XP computer for the past decade and a half because it's about the only <laughs> one that still works. Uh, Axis and Allies. I have um, I have a bunch of versions, but the best one that I have is Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition, and I think it was hundred bucks when it came out. And uh, it's just this mat. It's the biggest box I own. It's this huge box. It doesn't even fit on my shelf, and. Uh, yeah, we, when you, I, I think the boards, it's like, yeah, it's like two boards, you know, two regular size boards you slide together, and uh, and it's just this mat. I think they even added a sixth player. It's usually five players. They added Italy as a playable side. I've heard you of know? that. I, n- I never got that one, but I've heard of that. Yeah, we. I got. I managed to play it a couple of times with some friends, and it's just a great time every time. Oh man, I need I need to get a hold of that at some point, just because that just sounds like the most amazing thing. Uh, the, the last oh, yeah. uh, the last version I played I think was Pacific, and I got extremely yeah. frustrated with it because my dad was way too good at it. <laughs> Turns out when it's the only game you play for about a decade, you get excessively good at it. 
So if he, yeah. he he just completely swarmed Pearl Harbor and occupied the west coast of the United States before I could do anything. So. Oh, I've got I've got at least one friend like that that I actually I think last time we played Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition, he, me and the rest of the geek squad, we took on we were the um, I think we were the Allies, and then he took the entire he just played the Axis by himself. He just grabbed all three. <laughs> factions <laughs> and, he, and he just crushes us you know the, the game can go I don't know what 15 rounds or 12 rounds or whatever and he goes if you know, were in the end of, end of round four and we're like well uh, you know Germany is as like on the at the gates of Moscow so I think we're gonna call it you know <laughs> Germany has successfully occupied the East Coast so I think it's a joke <laughs> exactly we're speaking we're we, we've got we, we're doing man in the high castle uh, reenactment. <laughs> Uh, I have unfortunately had the uh, bad luck in my life of being surrounded by sore winners when it comes to my gaming. I, I I've was super into Brawl for about a month, then one just one guy at my work comes in, beats four, three guys in a row, just goes, YEAH! 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 And I'm just like, you know what, I think I'm done with this game. It's just... <laughs> it's yeah, just no, those freaking guys. Have you, have you been keeping up with gaming at all? Or video um, gaming, I should say. Yeah, I um, my problem is that I'm so out of step with the what whatever the current gaming trends are. Like everything is battle royale, everything's multiplayer. You know, I, I like a good classic single player game. You know, be that an RPG or um, or a first person shooter. You know, I, I I just like I like cranking through those at my own pace, and so. I'm not super interested in a ton of stuff that that comes out because it's all you know, I don't know, microtransaction games as a service, uh, you know, battle royale, uh, Doom Eternal's coming out, and I'm excited for that. Ooh, I just, I feel that. Some... I mean, I, I've been yeah. I've been working on Cuphead for the past month or so on the Switch. Yeah, I haven't picked that up yet. I, I, I've got some friends that enjoy it, but. Yeah, that, so that, that's a really good game when you want to get frustrated. So you yeah, I, you know, I, and I really, it, it's kind of like, um, it's like bullet hell, right? Yeah, essentially, like, it, it's very. It, it takes a long time to just kind of figure out this, uh, the way that, the way the game is. What's it called? Just, uh, just the the attack patterns, and you can, it's, it's all about kind of memorization, and you, you end up fighting like every boss about twenty times before you get it, or more. Yeah. I, I, you know, if those games are designed well, where it, it doesn't become frustrating, but it, you, you know, it's like every time you get that little bit further, and you start to figure, I don't know, almost like a like Dark Souls or whatever, where you know, it's it's tough, but it's like, oh, okay, there's a pattern here, you know, and, and you can start to figure it out. I, I I actually do enjoy that. That's exactly it. It's it's got that design. It's got a very good like design. It makes you feel like you're at fault. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoy that kind of stuff. Um, uh, there's an old, uh, there's an old bullet hell shooter called, uh, Jamestown. I don't know if you ever played that. It was on Steam, I think. James, uh, that's a, uh, that's an interesting name for a bullet hell shooter, but. It, well, it's, it's like, it's, uh, it's like this kind of weird futuristic steampunk where, uh, the, the, uh, the world went and colonized Mars. It created a colony called Jamestown on Mars. And they, of course, the aliens, you know, attack or whatever. And it's just like this retro pixel art style. And it, it kind of went under the radar, but um, yeah, that, that that would be one of my favorite in, in that category. I could see that. I, for a second, I was kind of imagining it like in the style of a, what, like a, just like a really epic Japanese game, but set in like up the Pilgrim ja the Jamestown settlement. I'm like, this is... Well, I mean, and it kind of kind of comes off like that because it's like they're settling, they're settling Mars, but it's like um, it's like airships, you know. I guess it's almost like um, you know John Carter, Princess of Mars type stuff. Probably took a lot of inspiration from that. Yeah, probably. I mean, that that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. What you, you can't go wrong with airships, but. <laughs> <laughs> So, do you have any interesting projects going on? Uh, I know you did the book last year. Um, 
yeah, you know, it's actually, it kind of, it kind of feels like, uh, in the creative space, it's like, everything comes in waves, you know, maybe it's just life, life comes in waves, you know, so, we had the book launch, I switched, that's right when I, uh, quit my job and started doing writing full time, and then, uh, you know, and then you kind of get into that groove. And so just recently, it's kind of been a flurry of activity. We're, we're working on a bunch of stuff. Look, working on some more book ideas, you know, uh, to follow up How to Be a Perfect Christian, which came out last year. Um, we're working on a best of book that'll, uh, that'll come out at some point. Uh, that's been something that people have requested for a long time. I got personal projects I'm always working on. Um, you know, just like any good writer, I've got 20 unfinished books uh, <laughs> that's what I'm working on at any at any given point so um, I, I've always wanted to do there was a all right this is super nerdy there was a uh, there was an old there was an old, there was an old tabletop game in the uh, 80s called amiibo wars and uh, super obscure and uh, it's, it was basically like Risk, but in space. And 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 uh, there was like a con- there was like a game controlled uh, race of amoebas that was fighting against everybody. So like everybody could lose if the amoebas win, you know, which was great. So I always wanted to turn that into a novel where you know uh, you got you got the humans that are trying to defend uh, defend the solar system against these mysterious amoebas that appear and start swallowing planets whole. So I. Uh, that's something that I would love to get back to at some point. The problem is, you know, I, 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 I work with like Christian publishers and stuff and it's hard to approach a Christian publisher and say, Hey, do you want to publish my book based on, uh, this board game from the 1980s about amoebas attacking, uh, the solar system? <laughs> I can you know, see, I can so, see that as a hard pitch. Yeah. It's a difficult pitch. You know, you really <laughs> got to wine them and dine them to, to get something like that going, yeah. So that's the stuff we're going to. We're actually we're about to launch a podcast. Uh, we just rec- I, we just recorded the first episode today, so um, that's going to come out soon. That'll be a lot of fun. Cool. That sounds awesome. That sounds really awesome. Yeah. So I I think things are kind of <laughs> they kind of hit a wall. Uh, I, I appreciate well, you- hey, I appreciate you coming on, man. No, I'm gonna no. We we, we have not hit a wall. Uh, I am going to talk about Amoeba Wars for the next 15 minutes. All right, go ahead. (laughs) I'm just joking. But yeah, definitely play Amoeba Wars. It's great. Um. (laughs) No, that's great. It's awesome. I I do appreciate you coming on, though, man. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for chatting with me. It's been fun. Sure thing. Have a good night. All right, have a good one.